How do you go beyond having agile transformations only happening within IT? How do you reach beyond the management layer so you can change the whole operating system? That's the topic for this lightning talk. Agile in the boardroom and beyond. Presented to us by Jurian Kamer. Jurian is a change agent at The Ready. He works as an organization designer and transformation coach. And as you will see, he's a great speaker. He's also the author of Formula X, a business fable about speed, leadership and organizational change. I just got myself a copy and I'm truly looking forward to reading it. At the end of this talk, Jurian will share a story about an experiment where a boardroom and its team members uh, managed to cut down their weekly recurring fixed meetings from 40 down to 12 hours. Yeah, you heard me. Jurian, go at it. So I'm going to talk about Agile in the boardroom and beyond, because I think it's, it's not easy to engage managers, leaders, uh, C-level uh, teams to, to this whole world of Agile and new ways of working. And I have some thoughts about that to share. First, real brief about the company I work for. It's called The Ready, an organization design and transformation consultancy. Um, our purpose is to change how the world works, to realize a more adaptive and human way of working. Um, I've been writing a lot about why Agile hasn't fixed your problems in the past. Um, and this, you know, this comic always comes to mind, right? I've been finding myself inside Agile transformations when I was working in a, in a little fluffy corner of the, of the organization, like this little red thing here on the, um, on the slide. And um, yeah, everything else wasn't changing. Everything else wasn't, uh, you know, adapting towards the new ways of working and the increased pace in the, in the, in the different corners of the org. Uh, mostly in IT, we see, you know, we, have, we obviously see lots of uh, agile transformation happening in IT. But you know, how do you go beyond that? How do you go through this management layer, and how do you change the whole organization operating system? Is the question. And it's good to to talk a little bit about some some misconceptions I found in the field. So um, we think leaders, you know, a lot of leaders think that agile is a project management method just for for the teams. Um, but actually, we're talking about a real mindset shift in management. Um, people think it's about implementing a specific methodology. But it's, but it's really, in my mind, changing your way of working where necessary. It's not about a fixed framework, a fixed methodology. Um, we're also not talking about redesigning a one-time new blueprint for the new organization and then implementing it. No, instead, it's about continuously adapting how we work. And you know, sometimes we feel these new, new ways of working are the solution for our problem, but actually it will help you discover where the, where the actual problem is if you start accelerating. So these are some of the, the shifts I see. Um, and you know, to achieve agility in the whole organization, we need to change our operating system. And this notion of, of the organizational operating system is well described in uh, Brave New Work, uh, the book written by my colleague. Um, and th this idea of the, of, of the organizational operating system is quite similar to, to what you see in your computer, right? If you, if you have a computer or a phone and you get a notification that you need to update your operating system and you don't update it, over time, your computer or your phone becomes a brick, right? You cannot do anything with it. You cannot run the latest apps on it. And I think we have a similar problem in our, in our organizations. We need to start upgrading the assumptions and mindsets and beliefs that everything else runs on. Um, and to introduce that concept a bit more, and it's a helpful metaphor I also often use with management to explain this, this thing, is the idea of the, um, crossing the street, right? So there's two, here are two different operating systems that are trying to solve the exact same problem. They have the exact same objectives, right? You want to create as much traffic flow as possible and uh, reduce collisions as much as possible. And, and, but both of these have very different assumptions about how, how to solve the problem, right? The left system is, is a lot about control and compliance. You know, we, we want to have people um, uh, in the system being told what to do, right? We cannot trust them possibly of, of doing the right thing on their own. Uh, we need to tell them. And the other assumption is that we need to program all the different possible scenarios inside that little computer box in the middle of the, of the intersection. Um, so it's a lot about planning and predicting and then controlling what is happening. And this resembles a lot how we work in our traditional bureaucracies. Um, well, on the right side, with a roundabout, we, we're actually building our system more on trust and autonomy. Right? When you approach a roundabout, you're actually trusted that you're going to figure out yourself, how am I going to navigate this intersection? What is the right speed? What's the right moment to break? What's the right safe moment to start accelerating and entering the roundabout? You know, in other words, it's the, it's the figure, it, figure it out system. 
Um, there are definitely rules that we that we adhere to, like these agreements that we have, but those are more enabling constraints, right? It's not about controlling people, but it's about you know making sure that we have a system that actually works based on self-organization and, and autonomy, um, keeping the decision rights where they are in the teams. And this is, um, uh, in a lot of ways, the shift we see in organizations, right? Um, we want to move from the red paradigm to the blue paradigm. Um, and the, more importantly, when you talk to leaders and, and, and especially the boardroom, it's very important to highlight that the system on the right overall has much better outcomes, right? A roundabout has lots and lots of less uh, collisions and on average has a better traffic throughput. Another important thing to highlight is that it's not black and white, right? There's definitely moments and situations and contexts where control and compliance still makes a lot of sense. So it's about navigating this shift in a way that's balanced. So this kind of metaphor helps when explaining the shift, uh, even over starting to explain how, you know, how the practices work. <clears throat> but if you're making this shift, it's, it's important to look at the assumptions about how we think about people in the system. And this is based on theory X and theory Y that's already um, 50 years old by Douglas McGregor, who wrote about it. Um, what do we believe about our people, right? Do we believe that in general people dislike work, find it boring, will avoid it? must be forced or coerced with, you know, with carrots and sticks. And, you know, people naturally don't take responsibility and need to be motivated by money um, and actually are not creative. So that, that's the mindset that is ba baked in, in a lot of our organizational practices. Um, and, and, and that they stem from a period where the workers actually had very low education and very low interest in doing the work. Um, but in fact, most people, and on the whole, actually people, they, they, they can definitely self-direct in pursuit of a goal they care about. They will naturally seek responsibility and do the right thing if they, if they know what the right thing is. And if you ask leaders, like, what, you know, what kind of people do you, are you are, everybody will say, well, I'm definitely theory Y. And then you ask them, like, how many theory X people do you have in your organization? Well, we have some, right? There's this, this conversation about it. But in fact, the research shows that actually naturally people are born and you know, growing growing up theory Y, but because they are maybe forced into a system for too long, people start sharing theory X behavior. But it's really about changing assumptions, not only in how you think about or about management, but also about how we design our organizations. So the operating system. Here's the operating system canvas from Brave New Work, which are twelve different views on the organization. So um, we, you know, we've started to research organizations that are evolutionary, that are progressive, that are doing things in a very different way. And we started asking them, like, what is unique about your way of working? And over time, these 12 different categories of things emerged. And we saw lots of organizations experimenting within, within those 12 fields. Um, we used this canvas both, both diagnostically to ask teams and leaders, like, how, how is it going when it comes to your meetings? How, how good are you prioritizing and planning? Um, you know, how, how good is your decision-making process going? But we can also use it descriptively. Like, what is the, what is the way, what is the agreement we're going to make about how we're actually going to orient and steer and innovate and structure our teams? And this, this OS Canvas gives you much more possibilities than, than the standard frameworks, which is more about implementing a process or implementing a set of rituals. Here, you basically lay out all the options and ask, like, what areas of the organization should we work on now to create more agility? Um, another important thing to, to think about is that I recommend looking beyond the Agile Toolkit. So I found myself, especially when I was starting in this work, uh, I came from an IT background, I came from an Agile background, and when I started talking to, to leaders and I talked about their problems around budgeting and resourcing and, and, and innovation and investment, all those things, I didn't have the tools to help them out in a more Agile way, right? I, I, you know, I had Scrum, I have a few other ideas, um, but there's actually a huge amount of new ways of working and, and different philosophies out there that are actually all moving towards the same direction. So as an agile coach, I, I recommend going a little bit broader and think about and you know get yourself educated in some of the other possible structures that are out there. And um, for the book as well, we, we researched like what is the commonality between all of those different new ways of working? And we found two principles that are that are very helpful, I think, when talking about this. The first one is is people positive, right? Having an organization that's based on trust and respect and is based on creating an environment where people can thrive with autonomy, mastery and purpose. 
The other element is complexity conscious, right? Allowing for emergence, thinking about, you know, not going make, going to make a five-year plan and then execute it religiously without looking at the reality, right? Iterating, doing experiments, doing short cycles and feedback loops. That's all complexity conscious. And definitely the Agile Manifesto and all the Agile, Agile practices, they have some form of both. Um, but it's just, an, I, I think it's a bit of an overarching principle of this, this whole um, this whole methodology and, and stream towards agile ways of working. So what does it look like when you apply those mindsets on the OS canvas? You get you get these almost like from twos, and we shouldn't use them as from twos because there's a, there's a risk of of thinking that this is actually the current situation and this is the the the, the goal. But it's like, <clears throat> what does it look like if you, for example, generally, if you start going from an annual fixed planning in the resources field to relative rolling budgets, or when you go from, <clears throat> from a maturity model madness, which we see a lot in HR and mastery, to more self-directed, self-assessment-based uh, um, mastery systems. So here are just a couple of ideas of what those shifts could look like when you go from traditional ways of working to more agile ways of working. And if you start thinking about it this broadly, you have conversations with all the different elements in the organization, and you have lots of options uh, to, to improve agility in the organization. Um, and again, I want to reiterate the importance of having an adaptive organization, which is basically continuously evolving through experimentation, right? If you if you look at some of the, the, the big examples, like Jimmy is doing a lot about Spotify, he will tell you, tell you all the time that the Spotify model is almost like a photograph of how it was at one point, and it actually has continuously evolved into different places. So it's never it never stops. So we have to go out of this fixed mindset that we often see with leaders, like we do one big reorg to, we're going to do an agile transformation, and at a certain moment, certain moment it's going to be done and we're never going to change it again. And it's actually about something else. It's about creating the muscle, building the muscle for continuously inspecting and adapting on our organization itself. And this is what it looks like for us. So here is um, uh, the, the change loop that we use. Um, it's, it's very simple. Um, but the idea is that we want to practice continuous participatory change all across the organization. It's about teaching teams um, at every level of organization to how you know to create rituals for noticing tensions, considering new ways of working, different practices, and then running a rather disciplined experiment of what are we going to try for how long and how we're going to evaluate if it's actually working or not. This also gets you out of the mindset that every new tool is automatically a good fit, right? You have to actually do an experiment and figure out if it actually works for you or it actually solves the actual tension that you have in your organization as every organization is different. Um, and this is something we really encourage, especially on the boardroom level, to start this loop there as well, um, right? It's, it's a very easy way to get engaged in, uh, in, in doing agile ways of working, even over asking them or forcing them to work in sprints or to, uh, you know, to, to appoint a product owner or, you know, that is not necessarily the solution for their attention. So what does it look like in practice? So how do you engage management teams or boardroom teams or whatever uh, into this loop? Um, and th the question we, we ask is quite simple, um, and, but also powerful. The simple question is, what is holding you back from doing the best work of your lives? And it invites people to reflect on how they work and what are the tensions they are having uh, rather than telling them you need to adopt this practice or all the teams are doing this, so you should be doing that too. Like start where the tension is. And um, so, you know, in any team, uh, especially on the highest level, if you ask them like what is holding you or the whole organization back from doing the best work, they will come up with answers. Everybody has an answer to this. It's never going to be perfect. And they have ideas of what is missing or what could be better. And then the second part of the loop is considering different practices. So we have a whole set of different possible uh, practices on cards. So the tensions and practices cards are uh, something that we have available for, for this exercise. Um, and they contain lots of different ideas from all those different toolkits that are people positive and complexity conscious. So for example, um, uh, those practices are very much you know, related also to management layers like um, <clears throat> why don't we fill leadership roles through consent or election, right? It's quite radical, but why not? Um, why don't we phase out internal email and move to Slack, Teams, or, or Google Chat? 
um, why wouldn't we, you know, um, hold regular retrospectives to build learning into every team, project, or initiative? Um, and the retrospective obviously comes from the agile practice, but it could be applied everywhere as a, as a big important thing. Um, and the one I want to give you a short example of is the idea of using a meeting moratorium to rebuild our operating rhythm from scratch, our meeting rhythm from scratch. And that's one that's often very powerful and resonates with leaders as a, <clears throat> as a starting place. And what does it look like? So here's um, an experiment that we've run actually with a with a, a boardroom team. Um, their calendars looked a lot like this, right? Completely overloaded with meetings, meetings on top of meetings, and no time in the workday uh, to do any work. And I think in the pandemic, this has increased. It's becoming even worse. Um, so a lot of teams actually face this challenge. And what we've asked them to do, to look at their calendars, and the first thing they noticed is that they had over 40 hours of meetings that were there every week, any time, like the more than 40 hours of recurring meetings already on the schedules on top of all these, you know, these this impromptu meetings. So we asked them, like, why won't we just remove all meetings? Like, like, let's block our calendars for four weeks. Imagine the whole boardroom not being able to be in booked meetings for four weeks. And instead, tell the organization that you're running this experiment and that you're available in a certain corner of the, of the organization. In the past, this was the building. Like, you know, at this floor, if you want to talk to us, just come and talk to us. We're there. We're, you know, we're never, in, we're never in meetings. We're fully accessible. We encourage you to just stop by and talk. Um, and then, and then, you know, in modern days or in current days, you could do like, a, you know, an open Zoom call that's always there or some other way to reach leaders quickly. And then um, after the, that experiment, after four weeks, we asked them like, okay, which of the meetings did you actually really miss? Which of these did you miss? And let's install them as recurring meetings and design a meeting rhythm that's really fit for the purpose of the team and fit for the work that you need to do as a boardroom team. So they reinstalled, I think, something like 12 hours a week of fixed meetings in their rhythm. And you know they, they freed up their calendars and have lots of space for important things when they need it to happen or actually work time. Then just one example of an experiment. Um, and that's it. I'm curious of your thoughts and, and whatever Jimmy has in mind to talk about. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Jurian. Uh, great talk. And thank you so much for taking the time to be a guest on the show. You're welcome. Uh, I hope the audience or the people viewing enjoyed this as much as I did. I have a few follow-up questions. Sure. So I, I got the impression that you have a very similar journey as I have, so starting out as maybe as a developer, Scrum Master, and then been agile coaching for a while. So yeah. what made you zoom out and consider these holistic questions? What 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 happened or yeah. when did it happen? Well it's it's um it's been a painful journey. I mean I've I've done a lot of agile transformations. Um so I find myself being an agile coach and then helping out with our agile transformations within large corporates. Um, and you know, I was quite, you know, worked well. We had our little bubble in IT and product development and marketing. Like we, we did a lot of acceleration, a lot of, lot of improvement there. And then at one point, it became very painful um, for me because I, I started to, to talk. I had an opportunity to talk to the C level of the organization, which was like literally five layers above us, mm -hmm. to, to tell them like, hey, we're doing this little, you know, this experiment here, and it's going well. We have 150 people now working in new ways. But I started talking about well, the challenge is that we, you know, you still allocate budget for projects on an annual basis, which is very painful. Um, a lot of the decisions about prioritization happens in, you know, strange ways within management layers. So we have um, some struggles to to really get the most out of it. And then they were like, "Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's you know, that's part of part of how we work. I mean, they they didn't feel the need for changing that." And also, I wasn't able to explain to them possibilities of you know, doing it in a different way. I didn't have the language or the examples that would connect and resonate with those people. And they were all like, yeah, I mean, it's great that you're doing Agile and IT. You should continue doing that. And I was like, yes, but... What you know, don't you want to do it yourself as well? And I mean, they, they were really holding back the organization, um, in you know, with you know, not not uh, as a they were not sabotaging the organization, it just was just our default way of working, they didn't know anything else. But I also failed as an agile coach to explain what possibilities there are and inviting them into the change. So, yeah, I really felt I needed to broaden my perspective and, and become more holistic, like, like you said. Yeah, and, and I think you figured out if you uh brilliantly powerful metaphors. Uh, for example, the uh, I've heard it before, but the traffic jam and the roundabout metaphor is yeah. so powerful. But I'm curious, from your experience, do you have do you have a concrete example of a, of a traf uh, traffic light uh, mechanism process? 
Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, we can, I think a co quite common example within within your audience as well is the, the whole idea of the, the project manager being replaced by a product owner. And I want to go even further than that. So, um, right. So in, in very old day, olden days, um, projects and software development projects, we had one project manager that was kind of directing uh, directing the orchestra in a, in a more, you know, even worse than directing. It's like, you now do this and you now do that. And that, that person was kind of the, the, the traffic light above and everyone else was disengaged and was just like, ah, whatever. If, if the person tells me I do my thing, I do my thing. Um, and then we obviously replaced it to, you know, more self-managing teams. Um, often we still have a product owner, which is the person aligning with stakeholders and determining the, the, the backlog. But I could I can think of a more even more roundabout solution. Often when we work in teams, we don't have a product owner, right? We want we actually um, uh, encourage teams as a team as a whole to to figure out what is the next thing they want to work on, um, right? Pulling from you know, there's a, there's a, the purpose of the team is there. They have a sense of you know what is the thing we want to achieve, and then together they figure out what is the work for the next iteration. What is it that we need to do, and th so so. I, I do question that in many cases we don't need a product owner, which still feels a little bit like centralizing the authority over prioritization and what is in and what is out in the sprint into that person. But yeah, I you know I don't get me wrong, product owners provide a ton of value in specific organizations, um, especially if the system is complex. And actually, product owner in my mind is almost like a system, uh, like a symptom of a system that hasn't fixed their alignment and and uh, and, and structural issues. Um, if you're, you know, in the ideal world, you just have one team with 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 a shared vision and a shared prioritization that they do together, and they can just go. Yeah. And obviously, then the team can maybe decide that it's helpful for them to appoint someone in the product owner role. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's not it's not the default anymore. If you if you really go all the way roundabout. Cool. Thank you. Uh, uh, if you're viewing and you're having an itch to type something, well, you have the comment <laughs> field below. <laughs> this might be controversial, but looking forward to your comments. Yeah, um, looking at my notes here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the the story you told me, the example of the meeting uh, moratorium. So they the meeting moratorium. Yeah. So they they went from a kind of a fully booked forty hours a week uh, to uh, only twelve. Yeah. So I'm curious. Can you can you share anything about which which kind of meetings did they miss and reinstall? Yeah. Yeah, sure. The, so there's a couple. Um, I don't know the, the specifics anymore because it's already, I think, two years ago. But what we often see with leadership teams is that there's a couple of meetings that work well. Um, one of the meetings that, that we see often with these teams is, is, an, is a weekly action meeting. And it's specific, specifically designed for a team to come together, align, you know, share what is happening, look at metrics together, look at outcomes together, share, share progress. And, and then the second part is, Unblock the work. So we we basically have no fixed agenda. People bring up agenda items on the go, and they triage it in a way which is like you know what it, what do you need, and then we did you get what you needed, and then you you go on. So it's a very specific type. You can Google it. We have an article about the the, the weekly meeting, um, and it's designed to. So it's almost like um, uh, it's almost like a weekly stand up uh, type thing. But then yeah. more more flexible um, and 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 less geared towards a specific sprint, but more maybe we focus on ninety day outcomes that that they were achieving, or it's about creating contextual awareness and quickly having a forum to to make decisions. So that's one meeting. It's one hour or ninety minutes yeah. a week. Um, that's for this team. Um, then obviously you want to have uh, other meetings related to the different functions. So often when you see a leadership team, it's often not really a team. It's it's actually there's not often a shared thing. It's often we have the heads of lots of different functions mm -hmm. uh, that need to do things, and sometimes they have the, this team team of teams concept, but they also have their action meetings within their team. So that's the other set. They have their own. So they're basically on two operating rhythms, right? One operating rhythm of their team, and the other operating of their department that they're that they're responsible for. Yeah. Um, and there is often there's obviously things like retrospectives in there, um, not on a weekly basis, but but more like a, a monthly basis. Uh, or even every six to eight weeks, depending on the, the speed of the of the team and the organization, like come together for two hours and reflect how it's going. Look at outcomes. Look at look at the key initiatives. Invite people in, and then what we also also often see is this this kind of ask me anything session where uh, you want to be available for for the organization to to ask every anything. Um, uh, you know, I know that at Spotify, Daniel Ek does it every Friday. Um, this you know the the TGIF, which I think is a Google. 
originated idea, thank God it's Friday, every Friday, right? There's leaders coming on stage, telling what's going on, what is the context, what is what is happening in the world and are available mm -hmm. for, for questions. And I think that's a very powerful instrument to to create this um, this contextual awareness and create autonomy. Um, so yeah, this, it's, a, it's a set of things and there's, there's many options. Um, it depends on the context of the team, but those are some of the things that are, I see everywhere. Those are the patterns. Cool. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, have a brilliant day. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm looking forward to hearing from your audience and following your work. Keep up the good work. I love your videos. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any future great lightning talks. And on my website, you can find my blog, a web shop with my books, and any upcoming public courses I have scheduled. If you want to contribute to this channel and join the fun of playing Jimmy Kodge, please check out this video here. I promise you, it will be fun. And until next time, explore, have fun, and be safe.